Okay, welcome everyone at this um, discussion evening about penetrating walls. It's now almost 28 years ago that the Berlin Wall came down. It's almost as long as it has, has been standing. It's been standing for 29 years. And uh, of course, the fall of the Berlin Wall was a sign of hope, it was a sign of um, the end of a political division. The two parts of the German people who were divided for so many years could, uh, were reunited. And uh, in a bigger picture, you could, uh, you could even fantasize of, uh, about a new phase in world history, the end of the Cold War. There was this euphoric uh, book by Francis Fukuyama about the end of history with the last man. Uh, we supposedly had left behind all ideological disputes and would uh, enter a new phase of, um, well, boredom, <laughs> if you like. Um, but then, of course, as it happens, reality uh, didn't quite agree with it. Uh, in the Soviet Union, in, instead of a flourishing uh, democracy, we got uh, capitalist kleptocracy, authoritarian uh, government. Uh, as a response to Francis Fukuyama, Samuel Huntington published his book calling Fukuyama a naive optimist and uh, um, uh, arguing that we would enter a period of a clash of civilizations worldwide. And um, uh, uh, the, the total number of, uh, uh, or the total size of wall spaces since November 1989 worldwide has actually increased instead of decreased. So those, those are somewhere facts and um, I think a good starting point for the discussion tonight which will go into questions like why do we have walls, are they really necessary, do we have to resist them and also what can be the role not only of politics but also of culture and art to deal with these questions and maybe turn things around to uh, turn it into a positive thing. Um, let me introduce my uh, the panel speakers of tonight. Left uh, to my left is uh, Sandra Fluk, um, attorney, politician, women's rights activist, also the California State Director of uh, an advocacy organization that deals with many different things. Uh, uh, I mentioned healthcare, uh, social justice, climate change, immigration, immigration of course. And um, um, I also read on your Wikipedia page that supposedly you have a dog called Mr. President. Is that right? That's true. Okay. <laughs> You'll hear maybe more about that as well. To my right is Sandy Blyfer, the organ organizer of this panel uh, tonight. <laughs> and uh, please have a good look around because you see her beautiful artwork um, uh, all around you. Uh, Sandy has been uh, thinking and interacting with walls uh, for a long time, also with the um, uh, idea of art as social activism, and uh, I uh, suppose that we will hear a lot of interesting insights tonight from her about the motivation of her work and how it relates to the idea of penetrating walls. And then to my far right is Peter Tokowski, senior uh, education specialist at the Getty Museum, who is also an adjunct uh, member of the Department of Germanic Languages at UCLA, and we just spoke about it, an organizer of an annual summer school which traveled from, travels from Berlin to Munich to Vienna and discusses all uh, aspects of history and art and also the politics of art. So welcome here. And, uh, the idea, uh, my name by the way is Jus Siegel, I'm the chief curator of the Wendy Museum in Culver City, which is a collection of Cold War materials from the former East Bloc countries and the Soviet Union. I would like to start with the short introductions from the speakers, and then after that we will make it as interactive as possible. Sandra, can I ask you to sure. take the floor? Hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank Sandy as well for bringing us together and thank all of you for coming out on a, a warm evening to talk about a hot topic. Mm -hmm. I didn't even plan that ahead of time. Um, so 
I'm going to be speaking from a, a political and policy perspective, specifically about President Trump's campaign promise regarding the, the wall on the Mexican border, um, which I think many folks found to be one of the, and, and there's stiff competition for this prize, but one of the more offensive proposals that he put forward uh, during the campaign and unfortunately has continued to uh, work to enact since becoming president. Many of us are deeply offended from a position of American values, from an understanding of America as a country of immigrants, as a society of immigrants, as a place that welcomes and celebrates diversity. Uh, but there are also significant criticisms uh, of this proposal from, a, from an economic point of view as well. First of all, it's incredibly expensive. Uh, the proposals range as high as $14 billion. I can think of a lot of things that would benefit the U.S. that we could do with $14 billion. Uh, unfortunately, some of the congressional proposals on how to pay for the wall are actually taking funds away from uh, other sources that do actually keep us safe, things like the Coast Guard, uh, the State Department, um, actual border security, not a wall, which is, is uh, agreed upon by experts as not an effective uh, way to, to secure our border. Um, so really what we're talking about is a wasteful and ineffective vanity project that is also incredibly uh, racist and counter to American values. Um, and the other aspect, just aside from the sort of waste of government funding of the wall, is that this will be very harmful to the American economy. Um, so what may, many may not realize is the Mexican economy has really changed in recent decades, and their economy is doing much better, and a lot of the, uh, the actual job activity and economic activity along the border is coming from cooperation between Mexicans and Americans living on both sides of the borders and towns that actually straddle the border uh, as well. So erecting barriers and preventing the free flow of people and goods on that border is actually going to be harmful to our economy and to job creation in those areas, which is why you see uh, a very mixed reaction from elected officials who represent areas and communities along the border. So maybe I'll pause there and we can come back and talk about some of the, the specific legislative and political responses that we're seeing at the local, the state, and the federal level around this proposal. Thank you very much. Peter. So, so I think my role is a, a lot more abstract than that. Um, I think I was invited to participate for two reasons. One is, as you have mentioned, I lead a group of UCLA students to Germany every summer. Um, and we spend two weeks in Berlin. And, uh, it's, it's been a particularly interesting experience in the last half dozen years where I'm talking to students who have come in of age in this, this post-Berlin Wall world where, of course, I have no idea what it was. And when you try to explain something that was completely absurd when it existed, you realize how absurd it was trying to make sense of it with students. But so we've been thinking a lot in, in that context about what lessons could be learned um, from the Berlin Wall, the lessons we were supposed to have learned from the Berlin Wall. One of our mem memorable moments was in the summer of 2008, you may remember, then candidate to Barack Obama gave a large public speech in Berlin, and the, the refrain of that speech was, people of the world look to Berlin. And so one of the discussion points ever since then with the UCLA students has been, what are we looking to Berlin for? What can we learn from that? Um, and then, a few years ago at the Getty Museum, we had an exhibition of work, a career retrospective of the, um, the, the great Czech photographer, uh, Josef Kudelka. And we included a section in that exhibition of work that he had done, uh, the wall, the Israeli wall in, in around the occupied territories. Uh, <clears throat> and that, there's an interesting story behind that work. He was invited, there was a project that uh, I forget exactly how it originated, but it was, was sort of a tourist board kind of driven project where uh, someone in Israel invited a group of leading photographers to come and take pictures. Um, I think the, the project was called, called Holy Land and sort of show how wonderful Israel is. And Kudelka uh, agreed to do it only if they let him take pictures of the wall, uh, which he ended up doing. And so at the Getty, we organized a one-day conference talking about border walls, and it was at that point that I learned, uh, again, as you guys mentioned, how active this industry of wall building has been post 
post-Berlin Wall, and it's really tremendous, and it's ongoing, and of course now part of our own political discourse. So it's in those contexts that I've been thinking about walls, not only as metaphorical lessons from which we can learn, and this kind of connects to Sandy's work here, but also uh, looking at how photographers, and then moving beyond that, how other artists have engaged with walls as surfaces, as issues, and asking questions about whether art can can be a, uh, an effective foil against wall building. So that's where my interests lie. And uh, there's no question that walls are good to think with. You know, they're they're very they're concrete. They offer surfaces on which one can apply not only graffiti and illustrations, but also ideas. And so. Sandy's given us a kind of occasion to think with and about walls. Sounds like we need more walls in order to uh, advance art. It's, it's not the human that is. Yeah. Um, I never started out to make a political statement with my artwork. Um, I'm a paper artist, and I look through the lens of paper and everything in the world, and I'm always wondering what paper and paper manipulation techniques can say about a certain subject matter. And these walls, uh, when, when I started uh, with handmade paper and uh, even when I was doing silk screen printing, uh, I realized that paper could replicate a variety of wall surfaces. So that's what gave rise to the series. And it was way back in the 80s mid 80s to maybe the early 90s, I did a, a long series of walls pieces. And what happens with all the work that I do is um, that it, they take on different layers of meaning as time goes by. They were inspired by one direction and they end up uh, one way of thinking about the subject and they end up having another context. And since 1995, when I traveled my Hiroshima and Nagasaki Memorial Project, which was um, a body of 35 figurative paper sculptures uh, to Japan and the US. Um, and my goal was, and, and the project was not just an art exhibit, but we had educational programs, dance performances, community meetings, uh, each, uh, uh, venue was uh, was rep was managed by a local community in every city, and they brought in their own um, relevant topics. And so I, my feeling is that with artwork, which does not have buzzwords that tend to turn people off or uh, conjure up negative connotations, perhaps, an artwork is just a collection of colors and surfaces and and imagery that people can read their own interpretations into. They can, uh, it reminds them of things that are personal to them. And by engaging on a very personal level with things that are not preaching to them literally, that are open, that um, resonate with them on a personal level, they're able to engage uh, other subjects like um, the feasibility of a wall and they're able to perhaps change through a whole self-examination process. So um, my reason for um, trying to orchestrate this, which is in the model of my past projects, um, which involve community interaction, is to uh, try to archive a thoughtful discussion, and I hope we'll have a, a lot of audience participation uh, throughout the, uh, the panel discussion, so that when uh, uh, these things come to the forefront and there's an urgency to, uh, to take a re make, react, that we have this thoughtful discussion archived for people to consider these are things that should not be shoot from the hip uh, responses or off the cuff or, or emotional. Uh, the whole idea of creating a border wall uh, needs to galvanize a broad base of support people coming from all perspectives. 
And um, so we need sort of a context or a mixture, I think, for, for that process to take place in an effective way. Thank you. So let's explore a little bit where we agree. Um, let me ask a few of you the questions. Are walls always bad? Or are there situations where it can actually be useful to have a wall? Well, since you, you, know, you made the comment already about my, my statement that maybe we need more walls, and you know, we don't have to, border walls obviously are a special species of wall and especially deciduous species of wall, but we have walls, they hold, you know, we have walls around us in our homes and um, we can think about just, if we think locally about what walls mean to us, we have walled communities well, neighborhoods that really stem from the same kinds of fears that drive the idea of a border wall. But we also have all of the debate over graffiti and tagging in Los Angeles. Um, it just shows how much is at stake here with a wall. But what, you know, what would happen if we just started actually building more walls around that could be used for artistic purposes? And I don't know if that would satisfy all of the tagging interests, but wouldn't it be interesting if we invited people to have community walls. I mean, we have the, you know, the Great Wall. Of the, um, we have the wall down in Venice with, for graffiti that's been used successfully. We have Judy Baca's Great Wall um, out by LA Valley College, where she and her students have put up the history of Los Angeles. So there's all kinds of wonderful things that can be done on surfaces which are necessary and so forth. So in that sense, sure, let's let's have walls and let's make creative use of them um, instead of just using them uh, as indicators of fear and, and territoriality. And let's have artistic walls. Are there also situations where you could say, let's have political walls? Um, well, you know, the first thing I was thinking about when you asked about our walls necessary was the issue of homelessness. Um, you know, I have never had the, the incredible misfortune of being homeless, but there have been moments, and I, I think if all of you think back over your life, there have been you know, sort of moments when you were stuck out in the weather for a really long time, your car broke down, or something happened where you could not find shelter, and you have just, for just an instant, felt the feeling of someone living on the street, and just the walls and the roof are so incredibly meaningful. Even if that's an empty room, it's such a big difference than just being completely exposed. And so, unfortunately, I think walls do come, this desire for border walls come from a similar place of wanting security, wanting safety. Uh, but the, the problem we have right now, when we're thinking about the Mexico wall, uh, is that there's not a security risk that is happening. There are not millions of immigrants flowing across the border. They do not pose a security risk to the United States. Um, so this is built on a, a false fear, um, but comes from a similar place of, of wanting safety and security uh, in reaction. So I suppose some walls uh, are a good thing in that way. Uh, I think there are good reasons to have borders, but not good reasons to have walls on borders as a gross generalization that makes me very uncomfortable as a political speaker. <laughs> Um, well, I think the, the thing that disturbs me about the walls is that it's an effort to imprison the people that we're fearful of in this country onto another side, into their, their space. It represents a mean-spiritedness and a, and a um, fear of, of the other uh, in, a, in a very negative way that is not in keeping with our democratic ideals and our history of uh, being a diverse uh, culture and a diverse society. And um, when, I, when I was putting the pieces together to, for this show, I included what I call the concealed passageways of uh, pieces Again, they were formed because I wanted to use transparent papers as atmosphere, uh, as a, uh, instead of just as a wall surface. But when you look at them in the context of this exhibit, and I have two other pieces that also have uh, doorways in them, um, the idea of a portal, of a doorway, reinforces the idea that we can build all these walls, but there is a way 
if we can find our way through the confusion and the obscurity of the situation, there is a way that we can resolve the things that become barriers to us. And so I think the concealed passageways, um, just like the breaking down of the Berlin Wall, which is the moment um, in, in time that I chose for this piece, um, uh, says that, that we don't have to live with these barriers and we don't have, there is a way if we work toward it in goodwill that we can, uh, we can resolve the uh, negative feelings that, um, in, that inspired us to build them and reinforce them and patrol them and utilize them. Maybe just uh, before I um, uh, ask the public, ask you to uh, join in. One question to make it still more explicit. You, you mentioned borders can be useful, but walls are not. What is the difference? Well, um, I can see some ways in which you, you would you'd say there's not a difference, but um, I do think borders are important for delineation. If you think about the, the rule of law and knowing what law applies in the area where you are, knowing uh, what government you are subject to, that, that's important clarity that people need to have for living their lives. And so uh, I think borders are important in that way. I think we've also seen in, in recent years how um, globalization that is not regulated adequately can be very destructive to communities. And so I would not advocate a, a borderless society because I don't think we're egalitarian enough and equal enough uh, across the various countries right now for a borderless society to be beneficial to all. But you could argue that the war is an old-fashioned form of border. Absolutely, yes, you could. Okay, can I have some questions? Uh, okay. Um, we have a microphone here. Can I, if you take this one, I'll go oh. around. Okay. It's going to work. I would like to ask you about more of the connection with uh, the political concepts of the Israeli walls that have been set up. I'm somewhat ignorant on that. Well, I actually recently traveled to Israel. I was there in May and did see the wall. And you know, depending on which part of the wall you're at, it doesn't look as, as imposing as it might in, in your mind. Um, but it, it is a sad sight, at least for, for me, to see it, to see uh, these two peoples divided. And, um, but one of the most important things that I learned in Israel is that if you are an American who does not truly understand Israeli-Palestinian politics and policy, do not speak to them. And so I, I won't say too terribly much about uh, the situation um, there, uh, but I think it, it harkens back to some of our earlier uh, conversation about that it comes from a place of questions of security and how, how does Israel uh, keep its people safe and secure, uh, but it also causes some of the ramifications that we have spoken to that walls often cause of feeling more divided, Palestinians feeling trapped, uh, feeling unable to, to move about, uh, because there's not just one wall. There are borders and, and security barriers between particular cities within the Palestinian territories, and getting through those checkpoints is a, a daily hardship for many Palestinians. The yeah, Berlin Wall was officially called the anti-fascist protection wall right. by the East Germans, so it's always a mm -hmm. difficult uh, matter of perspective, I would say. And I would just add that, what, again, looking at the graffiti and different reactions to walls, it's apparent that in Palestine and Israel that the, the population is perfectly conscious of the relationship to Berlin, so if you go, if you Google the the Israeli or Palestinian wall. You can find pictures where people have written Ich bin ein Berliner on the wall, uh, different messages referencing the Berlin wall. 
on that wall. So <coughs> there is a recognition that, that there are lessons to be learned or that haven't been learned uh, about walls and that we're repeating that experience in, in new ways. Um, I, I can just speak. Yeah, yeah sure. I, think. Yeah, I wanted to second your uh, suggestion that the Venice art walls have been a benefit. As a person who's lived and worked in Venice for over three decades, I saw the change when the walls were preserved and how long it took them to do that. Um, and, uh, another thing that may or may not relate is the Venice Skate Park, which took about 10 or 15 years to get done. It has no walls. Everyone can come watch people enjoy themselves. And uh, so the question, I guess it's a general question, but would you guys comment on walls that don't exist that we create anyway? Uh, because we, I think we all have them. Uh, whether it's um, reaction to an artwork, we have built walls around ourselves about what artwork we will look at and what we won't, or about politics or what we'll listen to and who we'll listen to. Uh, we create prejudices, I think, every day without realizing it. And so <clears throat> I think that's one thing that's great about Sandy's work is because paper is a universal form of communication. And I think that that's really what's interesting to me is how something can be used for a sword and then a plowshare, you know, right afterwards. I guess I'm making a general statement, but maybe you guys can comment about the, the kinds of walls that we can't see. That we Thanks, uh, that's great. I mean, I, I think all of the, the negative walls we're talking about, they come out of fear, right? So we, we, we have fears, and then we create walls as some prophylactic to try to resolve those fears which are wrong. And, you know, skate parks are a great example of that because you know when skate parks are proposed for a neighborhood or similar things that might attract a diverse youth, fears come up and people fight against them and so forth, and then you want to have gates around it at certain hours and so forth. And it turns out we don't need it, right? Most people are decent and they're going to come and treat surroundings with respect and so forth. So that's a great example of how the wall isn't needed and the fears are unfounded. Your question made me immediately think of this phrase that the German author Peter Schneider used after the wall came down, which was the wall in people's heads. I mean, the, the crazy thing is you build up a wall for the wrong reasons, and it's there for 29 years, and then you take it away, it still exists in people's heads. Um, and so he posed the question when the wall came down, is how long would the wall in people's heads continue to exist? And you know, these, these gentlemen from the Venda Museum can answer, you know, if it's still there 29 years, 28 years later, or will it ever go away from people's heads? Or maybe it is. But So you can have these invisible walls in people's heads, which are reified uh, by physical walls that are made from the found a fear in the first place. So you, you touched on a really kind of fascinating thing there. I would like to add, I just, in my introduction, I mentioned Samuel Huntington. And um, it's quite interesting if you look at his global map that he um, uh, reproduced in his book, where he identified eight or nine world cultures, mostly religiously inspired, and gave them all very primary color you see this neatly divided global map with all the different colors as though there is no migration, there is no <coughs> ethical or cultural diversity. And of course, there are no walls on the map. In spite of the fact that there are no walls on this map, it's very much a walled map. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the interesting things about this topic is that we tend to think of our politics in terms of walls, you, uh, metaphorical walls between Republicans and Democrats, between progressives and, and conservatives. Uh, but this issue of the, the Mexico border wall actually doesn't divide down those partisan lines in the way that you would think that it would, um, which is sort of an, an interesting twist, right? Um, you know, of course, for the most part it does, but the, the representatives of the communities that are actually along the border have very mixed reactions that don't uh, fall in line with political party because at some places on the border there are concerns 
Yeah, you can't have migrants crossing a border um, without there being concerns that arise between the people who live there and the people who are crossing without putting fault on other, either side of that, but there will be challenges to managing that. So some communities are concerned about that, and then in other places, they want to promote free trade and they want to see uh, the economic flow back and forth. So there are mixed reactions and, and bipartisan reactions along the border. And we've actually seen um, in the House, when the, the funding for the, the wall was proposed, they needed to package it in a, a complicated type of bill uh, that went along with a lot of other things so that they would be able to control the Republicans who didn't want to vote for funding for the wall. Um, some of the ones who said, wait, Mexico was supposed to pay for this and we don't want to pay for this, for example. And then in the Senate, um, there is a group of Republicans, including the number two Republican in the Senate, who have stood up and said, no, actually, we're, we're not interested in funding the wall. This is our alternative proposal um, for what we want to do about border security. And they have problems with Senate Democrats who uh, are very hesitant to vote against the wall because of it being coupled with border security. And some of them represent states on the border that are very concerned about border security. So it's just interesting to me that you would think that this one would follow the, those partisan lines and it would be on either side of the wall, but it's actually an issue where uh, folks are mixing back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, uh, David. I'm sure. Yep. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Lucy Duarte. I'm an artist and I'm uh, uh, from Mexico. And um, um, I would like to address uh, uh, what you've been saying. Uh, my grandmother, uh, grandfather, was born in Santa Barbara, California, Mexico. And um, since the Mexican-American War, my family has been from Baja to Southern California. And uh, for us, uh, especially in, in the southern part of the border, which we call La Linea, we do not refer to them as a, as a, a muro or a, or a wall, and a lot of things was, had happened. One of the things that my grandmother used to be very uh, uh, insistent of, of letting me learn was that what you resist, uh, she used to say, lo que se resiste, persiste. What you resist, persist. And, and it's like if you, if you look, for instance, the, the Israeli and Palestinian conflict, They've been resisting each other for 2,000 years, and it doesn't seem to be a solution to that. So, so and it's more like a Christian kind of way of, of looking at what my mother, my grandmother was was referring, and he's saying is like if something that that is being addressed to you, you don't like it, instead of resisting it, like come up with something different and invite everybody to come and join you with that. And, and that creates like a, a way of uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, avoiding this, this resistance that, that, that sometimes um, this revolutionary kind of way of looking at things and ah, is this is unjust and I'm willing to die for this kind of, uh, us not taking us as humans to nothing. Another thing is that uh, this, uh, I would like to kind of put a context with the Mexican border and uh, to think about the Chinese uh, wall. The Chinese wall at this particular time has no political and no real value for the Chinese. At one time, for the Chinese, it was so important. And it was like uh, so many people was killed and, and, and and so many slaves were used to do that. So um, what I'm saying, um, contributing to the conversation, is that there is a way that things have among pe reasonable people, and usually we end up to be more reasonable than unreasonable. Historically, we end up picking up the good things about what we do and, and relinquish the things that we don't uh, uh, it doesn't do us any good. So I'm saying uh, do not resist 
to not resist the, the fact that there is a, there is a, a, a linear and a division and uh, because eventually the, the, the living and, and the, the survival, the, the survival uh, instinct of humans will allow us to put things on the right, on the right context. Thank you so much for sharing, especially the, the personal experience. Um, you know, in some ways, it, you sound like a political commentator giving advice to the Democrats because many people <laughs> have said, "Stop being against the following things and be for something." Um, so, so that's uh, probably words well said. Um, you know, one interesting reaction that we've seen from the immigration advocacy community. Uh, to not only the border wall proposal from President Trump, but to the rest of what he has proposed around immigration, which uh, of course has been very deeply racist and problematic, is that the, the wall is not actually the thing they're most concerned about. And I think for, for Americans who are not as connected to immigrant communities, that might come as a surprise, but because the numbers of people crossing over the border illegally have dramatically dropped in the last 15 to 20 years, um, that is not as big of a humanitarian crisis as some of the changes around uh, who can come into the country based on familial connection and all of these types of proposals and the mass deportations that are uh, being attempted and, and planned and, and put into place. Those are a much bigger policy concern. Now, that does not mean that this, this wall, if built, will not have human consequences um, because there are still some people crossing over the border and this is an incredibly dangerous thing to do and could really increase the, the health and the, the moral toll uh, for folks who, who are trying to cross that border. Also, one quick note, they've lowered the environmental requirements along the border in San Diego County various areas along the border they've eliminated environmental requirements for building the wall. Which is just they've just gotten rid of them, which is really dangerous. So, I just wanted to thank you for bringing up the Great Wall of China. It's just a reminder that all these walls eventually become tourist attractions. <laughs> you know, I hope everyone noticed that um, in the back corner there there's some pieces of the Berlin Wall and it's just remarkable to think that like, basically that thing we almost had World War III over and now it's just some chunks sitting there on a the table. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, that's, you know, the, the course of history and it's important to kind of remember that as we debate current moments as well. I can add to that that the new building where the money museum is moving in November this year is the former National Guard Army building in Culver City, which was supposed to uh, uh, project the Third World War, and it is now housing the culture and everyday oh, life yes. of the former enemy. So, speaking about paradoxes. Cindy, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that uh, artwork and visual images might be able to express something that cannot be said by words. Words can easily be translated or used in an argumentative way, whereas images appeal to different perspectives of people, and uh, how do you think that works? Um, how can, in your case, paper walls actually penetrate concrete walls by not using words? Well, I think they, they are subjective. They're not literal. You can't tell me literally what that, that particular piece is. Um, uh, the, the paper that's the cover could be representing this, or could be representing that. The wall could, uh, the, the, the wall that's in the background that the doorway is in could represent, I mean, everybody would have their own interpretation of what's behind that wall or what that wall is, uh, is supposed to represent. So when something becomes subjective, it leaves room for the, the viewer's imagination to make connections and linkages and to evolve um, in their thinking by bringing their own experiences and themselves to it. So, um, uh, and then there's also dialogues that are set up, like Luis had a project in 
uh, Tijuana. It was Tijuana artists and Latino artists in Los Angeles. Um, and um, uh, they had a cultural exchange that went on. I think it's still uh, in going on. Um, where the artists uh, showed back and forth and exchanged ideas. So there are, there are dialogues that artists uh, establish between themselves to try to resolve some of the questions that they have even with creating their own work. And uh, yeah, this is very interesting that uh, uh, an experience that we, my wife and I, through a nonprofit, we've been doing this for the last uh, 15, 20 years, and bringing artists and poets from Tijuana and bringing in artists and poets from LA to Tijuana. And uh, one of the things that, that, that is very, um, even when we put a lot of energy in, into this and a lot of um, importance to this, and the artist who participates also, there is some sort of um, like, um, uh, 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 none of this believe like a sort of a lack of understanding, you know, when um, when you see artists uh, from different cultures, from different cultures, uh, and from different uh, 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 countries, that um, there is some sort of a defensive way of looking at each other, and um, and at the moment that is happening, at the moment that these exchanges happen is like a, it, it really kind of invigorates and, and, and creates a, a humanity and a, and a sense of, of understanding. And uh, is, but that, that powerful thing that happens in that moment it dilutes very easily uh, with the time and with the, so it's like um, you have to keep exercising this, exercising this, uh, this contacting and having people meet people, you know, instead of uh, uh, ideas against ideas or ideas put them uh, against ideas, is like people. The moment that uh, I, I I've seen people who are radically opposed in 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 their ways of uh, looking at art uh, become friends, you know, and become accepting their humanities and stuff. So is 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 this human uh, contact? This human interaction is what brings walls down. Is what brings a necessity of not having walls because because someone is imposing that to us that is out of our control. Usually, when when we have a wall, so it's like it's personal contact. It's people with people that uh, that that is what kind of prevents. Uh, the walls. Uh, I understand that the wall is a uh, is a necessity in certain aspects to build houses, to build, uh, to <coughs> kind of uh, uh, limit uh, your property and stuff like that. But in general, to kind of divide people, to say this is this is the, the way things are here, should be only here and nobody is allowed in in there, is um, is not human. Is not the real uh, human kind of context in which we all, as as Christians and Muslims and and, and people of, of honor, uh, we don't we don't do that. Or we don't want to do that, even when sometimes we do. Um, one of the things that was very I'm a poet, among other things, but one of the things that's important to me when we. Um, we lived in Pasadena and also Tijuana for like about 12 years. So we had a center, and the wall of our center ended here, and where Sandy is sitting was the border. And, and we had a three-story building, and that's why I did most of my writing. But the building we had was higher than the border. And I would sit and I, see, I would see birds fly back and forth. So the border itself, I didn't resist. I just acted like it wasn't there. Now, when I had to cross, you know, go through Central and all that kind of stuff, I understand that. But what was really important for me is what you bring to that particular situation. And what do you get out of that? And how that can help you grow and develop. And a lot of my work deals with 
making a difference, deals with freedom, being able to breathe, being able to, to open walls and, 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 and borders. Because unless you feel free internally, you might as well be in a jail, a self-made jail. So again, we have to rise above that border where the air is clear and free and the birds are going back and forth. And, and for me, a border was just kind of a thing over there. But having lived in that neighborhood for so long and becoming part of that neighborhood and having artists come from all over the world, it really takes you to another place. And, and it's something that began to shift and change. Because when we got there, it was just dirty walls. And when we left, there was greenery, there were all kinds of murals throughout the whole neighborhood, houses. So it's about also giving yourself an opportunity to be open. Thank you. Um, in San Diego, we have a uh, coalition called the Latino Jewish Coalition. And a year ago, I did a tour in Tijuana with a coalition. And it was also sponsored by Border Angels. Do you know Border Angels? Mm -hmm. Border Angels is an advocacy group for uh, no barriers. And they took us to a wall that got built right after 9-11. The wall got enhanced after 9-11 during the Bush administration. One, they told us that one day a year, they open it up and families unite. But it's only one day a year. And the whole day that I learned there, it's like they kept saying it's, it's education. It's people who don't live on the border, that live in Washington, don't understand what it's like on the border. And we're creating policy to affect an area where they have no clue how the daily life really is and how people interact with each other. And yet the federal government in San Diego is enhancing the border crossing. We're putting a lot of money in at the, the border crossing in Tijuana. Mexico has beefed up the border crossing with all the pedestrian crossing. And yet, now we're talking about building a, more of a wall in the prototypes in San Diego. So in my opinion, Washington doesn't get it right in that respect. <coughs> you won't get any argument from me on that. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought was so interesting was that uh, when President Bush did a big buildup of border security post 9-11, um, which is interesting that 9 11 hijackers didn't cross the Mexican border. But, you know, right. These are the details you don't fo focus on, right? Um, so, when there was a big board uh, buildup of security at the Mexican border, and it was through things like drones and uh, increased personnel and things like that, um, they called it a virtual wall <laughs> because there was such a need politically and, and I suppose on some sort of personal level for people who wanted this type of policy, there's such a need for the, to get the association of it being like a wall, that even when it wasn't about physical barriers, they needed to come up with a way to call it a wall. Right. So does that mean that walls like this are just symbols? That we actually should discuss the motivations and the thought forms behind it and not so much focus on the thing itself? I'll just say yes on that. Some of my other panelists chime in on that. <laughs> oh, I, I can raise my hand. I guess uh, to respond to a little bit of what you had said about um, forest attraction, um, I guess one of the most kind of uh, challenging aspects of the wall over the past few months, uh, for me, has been the imagination of the, of the contributors, the design contributors. Not so much the actual executive order, it's quite vague, but the, the kind of exactitude and imagination with which people approached it, that many of them actually incorporated into their designs the notion, the self-conscious notion, that walls eventually become tourist attractions, and included kind of walkways and parkland and two 
two-way mirror so you can see the guys on the other side, a tram that has a voice recording so that you can hear everything that's going on on the tram. Um, so, so in a way, this wall is a little different than the walls that have been built in other places simply because of the kind of temporal context in which it's being built. We're conscious of walls that have happened before. Uh, we've seen Kudelka's amazing photographs, so when we have those documents, kids are inured on many levels to documentary photographs, photographs now, um, and, and on some level they're also uh, in the walls that we build around our kind of professional communities even uh, kind of limit the amount of human contact that happens via art projects that cross borders. I mean, I was I was in a show that was in El Paso and we weren't actually allowed to go to the Juarez opening even though it was open the same night because we couldn't cross the border. Um, but I don't know how many people in the community around those shows was able to kind of uh, interact with uh, the work that we were sharing. Um, so I guess I guess my question, if I have one at the end of this for you guys, um, would be, uh, you know, if, if art's role is to on some level destabilize uh, paradigms, and in, and if in this wall we have many political paradigms, not just the physicality of it, but the fear and the lack of um, What have been your kind of, what's your experience of maybe historical models of artworks um, that have been able to break down some of those paradigms? And, and how do you think that those, those models would function now in such a self-conscious media environment? That's a really long question. <laughs> but yeah, basically, what's your favorite artwork that breaks down the paradigm? And do you think it now? I'm going to have to think about that. Because I mean, I think your question is getting at our work. It's not specifically about walls, as I've been. Um, you know, is there artwork that could change? But I mean, I had I, I left pulled up on my phone. I have to read this accurately. But, uh, it's from the Onion the other day, and the headline is "Local Dipshit Planning on Fighting Trump Administration Through Art." Exactly, I like that. And, <laughs> so, um, and you know, the article is quite humorous. It's worth reading. But the the whole point is. When you start with this idea, well, I'm going to subvert a paradigm or right. something through my art, it's not going to work. Um, so it's uh, it's something bigger. And I think that's where Sandy's work is relevant. You know, she's not coming at some agenda. She's just thinking about these images that we have and playing with them. And, and it's all about perception. And I think that's why we, some of us are in the museum business is we want people to experience art and we'll see what comes out of it. Just coming back for a moment to the earlier question that you asked about walls being a positive thing ever, and I was I was thinking about the the exhibit the piece over there, which is um, an example of the Western Wall, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, or some of you may have known it as the Whaling Wall, but the the Western Wall is a more appropriate term. Um, so that's the the wall that is a part of the temple, uh, and that is a, a holy place. Uh, for, for Jews to be able to go to. And so it brought to mind for me that walls are often the thing that is left standing of an ancient civilization. I mean, how many times have we seen ruins and it's just it's not a house, it's not a building anymore, it's just a wall or, or a few walls. And so they carry memories in, in so many ways um, of the past. I, I wanted to also to, it's, it's not a question, but more like a comment about, uh, I love the fact that you show so um, among your walls, gates, doors. It's like, and it's kind of, uh, when you say people, uh, people need to talk to each other, know to, to each other, and then they, they, it start to, uh, of a dialogue. And that is it's really very strong because in a wall there's always there's always like a fragment, there's always an open mic. And um, but when I came to this uh, I'm an immigrant myself and when I came to this uh, this country there's especially in LA, I don't know in other part of the country, I was shocked by this gated community. 
uh, dwells all around the city, and especially in, in the hill, bay, and it's it's a, this kind of way to yeah, like a protection, uh, security, and behind the wall, there's you know it's the same the, the, the same story and same terrible things happen. So there is a uh, it's interesting. It's like yeah, the wall. We we need wall and we we don't need them. But it's an endless uh, discussion. But thank you. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have any, um, any question, but I wanted to kind of say that it's beautiful to, to put the gate like an opening. Mm -hmm. um, just going back a little bit, you, you suggested that the wall may be a symbol, if you will. And to me, I mean, it clearly, it, it's, it's it is a symbol. I mean, it's a very powerful symbol, and it's a symbol that clearly works for our president at the moment, if you will. So we shouldn't forget the fact that it has, it, on, on one level, it's an enormously successful, if you will, mean that he's been, been pushing with this. So, and it brings to my mind what the question is actually about, what is it a symbol of, and it's really dividing us and them. Because that's what walls do, isn't it? They basically create this line, if you will, where there's, there's somebody on our side and then there's the, the barbarians, if you will, on the other side of the wall who we don't want. So to me, fundamentally, the question is not actually about the physical wall, and I take the point about the cost and ridiculousness of the rest of it. Because the border is actually very effective at the moment in stopping people. There's no point in building a wall. You know, there's no point. Um, but, as a symbol that says to us, we don't want you. And I suspect many of us in this room are, are immigrants or, or sons and daughters of immigrants here, if you will. Um, and it's it's something that I find quite uncomfortable, if you will, that many of the people that support this war, and many of the people that want to, to carry it forwards, if you will, are the people who, who would have suffered, if you will, if this, this, this concept of being there when, when, them, they, they, when they or their parents or their grandparents are here, because this country is built on a principle. So to me the question is, it's not so much about the war itself, but it's about the physical <coughs> idea. It's about the, are we welcome, are we willing to welcome immigrants into this country, or are we not? And I think it's a good idea. I think that America is a greater place because of its richness of our diversity and its people if you will, with its multiple cultures and foods and concepts and ideas and it's, and, it's, and it's beautiful, beautiful arguments that we have. But at the moment it seems to me that we're, we're basically saying to the rest of the world, you know, no, we don't want to be. So then maybe the big question that hovers above this night is why is that happening? Um, well, I would only complicate what you said just a little bit because we're not saying it to the rest of the world. We're saying it to certain parts of the world, right? Uh, there, there's no uh, broad outcry for a wall on the Canadian border, for example. Let me, let me interrupt slightly with that. Is that um, I was talking to um, the daughter of some friends of mine very recently. Um, who is not from Mexico, uh, but from Europe, mm -hmm. and um, was across effectively on a vacation, and she was having a discussion with some of her friends, and people were saying to her, why do you want to go to America? They're not a welcoming place, why do you want to go to a place that doesn't work? Yes, so I, I think there's a, a distinction between the, uh, the impression that people can have about whether or not we are welcoming of all people, and, and which signals we're sending about which people are, are welcome. And to be clear, I don't agree with any of those signals, um, but I do think we are uh, culturally right now and politically with President Trump in office speaking more loudly about certain people not being welcome more so uh, than others. If we think about the you know the, the number of countries that were part of the, the, the ban that was implemented in 
in early January, right? There were seven countries, and they were specifically Muslim countries, and it was said that it was supposedly about uh, concerns about terrorism, but some of the, the bloodiest terrorist attacks we've seen have been in France and in Britain, and we're not seeing bans against um, some of those, those countries uh, right now. But in terms of why it's happening, um, it's actually, part of it comes back to economics. There are a lot of folks who, um, to, to someone's point earlier, don't live on the border and, and think, and this is something they're not experiencing on a daily basis and therefore don't understand um, that these are communities divided into uh, who are feeling rightfully very economically insecure and their wages have been stagnant. They are having trouble finding jobs. They're having trouble uh, affording uh, to be able to take care of their family and they're looking for someone to blame. And they are inaccurately blaming a foreign other, um, someone coming to take the jobs. And that's not an idea that uh, people are coming up with on their own. That's an idea that uh, certain political leaders are very intentionally putting out there. <clears throat> I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about conceptual walls rather than physical walls. And for example, uh, Sandra, I know you're involved in the health care uh, issues, and I think what's transpired with the Affordable Care Act it represents uh, some conceptual walls that some of our politicians on both sides of the aisle uh, have dealt with. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear your comments. Can you say a little bit more about the types of conceptual walls in the Affordable Well, there are, there are those who believe that the uh, government should absolutely have no role in health care. And so they've built a wall in their own mind. Then there are those who believe, yes, it may be it should be the states, but it's the um, uh, the uh, the government uh, providing uh, uh, resources to the uh, 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 to other industries like the insurance industry to help subsidies. And there are those who are dead set, and they built a wall in their own mind about subsidies as being part of any agreement. So those are the conceptual walls that I'm referring to. And I think we can see those in many political issues, right? right. People take sides and arm themselves to the teeth and prepare for battle, uh, rather than sometimes trying to, to find agreement. Uh, there is going to be some, some bipartisan hearings on the Affordable Care Act at the federal level in the Senate, um, and there is also going to be some bipartisan uh, legislation put forward. Uh, it is yet to be determined whether or not uh, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell will allow that legislation to get anywhere. Um, the gentleman in the back is shaking his head, no, I think you're probably right that he won't. It's ironic because he had polio as a kid and he, he used it you know, federal funds and everything, his mother and everything else to, for him to heal. And yeah. he is so uh, convoluted in his thinking now. But yes, I, I think it's, you know, right now we do have a significant challenge in this area because both, you know, Democrats and Republicans are concerned about certain aspects of the Affordable Care Act and would like to make some changes, whether they could agree on which changes is unclear, whether or not they're going to be able to reach across that wall and, decide, and, and find agreement. Here, of course, we also experience the slippery slope of the concept of a wall, because in the end, you can argue that any disagreement is a kind of metaphorical wall, and then at a certain point, it is no longer useful to use that metaphor. And that might be something we might discuss as well. Um, I just want to uh, refer, what is your name? Uh, the, 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 the woman in the corner. Oh, the woman in the corner. Yeah. Um, she was talking about some of the designs for the wall. Mm -hmm. And in Venice, where we live, we live on one of the walk streets. And the walk streets are designed around uh, sidewalks that are, are bordered on two sides with fences that are no higher than four feet, according to the coastal plan. Mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, people in Venice, when they first moved there, were very frightened about, uh, especially in the beach areas where there's a lot of people coming on the from the uh, you know uh, outside, and they were starting to build you know 12 foot walls and barricades around their houses, but. Um, it's an illusion that it's it's not safe, but when you put a lower fence, something that is designed to be talked over and seen over and obviously can be breached from the outside, you, you take away all of the negative connotations of the wall. The design, which is an aesthetic expression that expresses an attitude of, you know, welcome versus fearfulness. So, and, and there were uh, contributions from the architecture and design community that, that tried to make the best of this, that yeah. tried to turn it into something positive, sometimes to kind of, uh, you know, fun or, or deliberately sarcastic effect. But, um, but primarily the, the architecture and design community um, mm -hmm. was shunning the proposal system in right. general, because to participate at all was to acknowledge its existence. So again, it's right. an artistic <laughs> response to yeah. a ridiculous uh, yeah. requirement, you know, an absurd and, and harmful requirement. Role of the artist. <laughs> and, and you know, your example from the Venice streets is a reminder that barriers don't work. I mean, that was one of the lessons from Berlin. It was always just a, it was a game. They would, they would fortify the wall in some way, and people would figure out a way to get over or under around it. And then they would make a <clears throat> correction and it would change to the wall after generations and generations. And you know, it, it doesn't, the fence that we have on the US border now doesn't, doesn't work. I mean, it's not complete, but it fundamentally doesn't work. And even Trump has been sort of changing the picture that right, he declared recently it had to be tran uh, translucent, so we, you know, you didn't have flying things coming over or whatever. <laughs> uh, but but the, the reality is, if people really want to get over, whether it's a 12 foot hedge or, or get under, or under, they're going to do it. So Absolutely. again, it goes back to it's not the physical structure that's part of the solution. It's some some idea or set of problems that lead to that kind of simplistic thinking. Years ago, I did a, I called it my brick wall series of paintings, and I realized something very interesting about the brick wall because you have the mortar. And what does a mortar do? It separates the individual bricks, and yet it unifies the wall as one. And, and walls are, I mean, they're interesting because they, they basically encircle certain communities. They close this community and protect this community, and yet separates it from other communities. So it's, it's kind of an interesting metaphor of the wall. Because again, in some groups, it, it works in a positive and protective way, and, isolationist, but uh, it could be stupid too. <laughs> Interestingly, um, just to, you know, Sandy was mentioning about the the, the hedges and the, the fences in Venice. Um, there are uh, one of the fiercest fights you will ever see at the local level, at the city council kinds of level, and neighborhood council levels, is how high your hedges can be or must be or should be. Um, and so, the, you know, these these walls that we create are from the micro to the macro on, on these kinds of political fights. Mm -hmm. The hedges are, sometimes it's a safety issue, it's around a corner so you can see don't be justifying your walls, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm justifying my head. <laughs> I'm hedging my nets. Yeah, right, exactly. Something very interesting about um, uh, the human way of, of preventing uh, neural uh, uh, fences to, to, to happen. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize uh, between Me Mexico and the United States is that um, Mexico, especially in the center part of Mexico, the industry and jobs has been uh, increasing. One, one of the reasons that a lot of Mexicans are not coming into the United States now is because there are jobs over there. If you, if you talk to any Mexican, and it says, if, if this job would be in Mexico, would you rather be? They would rather be in Mexico. So, so, so something is happening already. 
uh, uh, the, the problems that we have in the, in the border um, and, and the, the lack of jobs in there has to do with the instability that the, the, the traffic of drugs have created in there. But in the center of Mexico, Mexico is, is, is really the economy is even higher than, than the Canadian industry, you know, in general. The, the, the. So, so it's like that is mitigating the reason why uh, Mexicans are coming here and why a lot of people think that having a, 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 a wall in there is very important. Um, the majority of the people who are coming illegally f to the United States now from Latin America are not Mexicans, are from Central America or from South America. So it's like we have to look at those things. Uh, you many, uh, there's another thing that is very, I just spent some time in Cleveland and a, a friend of mine or a, a, a person that I've befriended in there um, was doing an investigation in one of the companies that were nourishing with parts to the Ford Motor Company in Detroit, uh, that was in Cleveland, uh, moved to Mexico. And he interviewed a, a worker that was doing one specific uh, job, and he had like a, a union job, mm -hmm. and he was making $30 an hour for doing that particular job. So he went to Mexico, to that company that moved to Mexico, right. and find the worker who was doing exactly the same job. Mm -hmm. So the guy in Mexico was making $10 a day for doing the same job. And, and his question was, but the cars are exactly the same price now than, than so someone is making a lot of money. So, so there's a, my point is that there is a lot of factors that have to do with the economy and, that create kind of feelings between people. And, and, and that's what the things that we have to kind of take care of and, and look after. Almost be a reason for Mexicans to build a wall. <laughs> <laughs> Keep the American riffraff. <laughs> maybe ultimately, maybe ultimately, the walls, the walls that you build, are yourself more than the others. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's more of a comment and to add to the dialogue. Um, so I just want to uh, preface it with a, a few things. Um, I'd like to address also the concept of immigration and the reasoning why people uh, immigrate. Uh, it can be different for people from various countries, but I really see it as a, a sort of balance. Um, I feel like uh, Americans um, tend to exploit uh, specifically entrepreneurs um, in various countries in the world, uh, tend to exploit those resources, and there has to be some something has to give, right? Um, I feel like the reason why people come to America is because uh, that's who has had the opportunity to profit from those resources, right? So um, I think that it's, in the end, immigration is kind of a, it's just a balancing act, right? There has to be some type of way that um, economically people can stabilize themselves, right? Because you're essentially, uh, taking resources from an area and people have to uh, return those resources to their families in some type of way. And just to speak to the Guadalupe Valle Treaty that um, the gentleman was talking about, uh, that Santa Barbara was um, a part of uh, Mexico before, what, 1970, I forget, 19, sorry, 1884 or something like that. Um, thanks for bringing that up just because I feel like it's a really important educational um, point, uh, being Californians and um, especially living in Los Angeles. I think it's really important to note that just um, less than 150 years ago, you know, this was Mexico. Um, so it's, in terms of historical time, it's so, it was so recent. Um, and um, in regards to President Trump, um, I really just feel like He's reflecting our outsides, like our insides are now reflecting our, our outsides, and 
uh, the world hasn't necessarily seen America as being uh, great, right? So sometimes I feel like he's actually reflecting what most people might see us or view us as in the contemporary sense. So I just feel like that border of, um, is that border that we have created as an Ameri American society is just now more visible with um, this presidency. Uh, and that sounds really um, antagonistic <laughs> towards America. I, mean, I love living here, right? But um, yeah, I just it's just some things that I wanted to uh, add to the dialogue. So. <laughs> Yeah, so your last point is also that this is a gradual process and not something that's all of a sudden appeared with a new president. Um, well, you know, we certainly we certainly have seen an a increase nationally in hate crimes since President Trump's campaign gained speed. And um, even here in California, I think sometimes folks tend to, to think that we're in some sort of isolated bubble, but we're seeing things here as well. The, the president pro tem of the state senate has an important immigration bill this year, and there's now a, a group of um, I, very hateful individuals following him about the state making um, really racist uh, comments and, and, uh, and threatening, sending in threats and also appearing it and events and things. So, so yes, I think there is a way in which um, President Trump's political rhetoric and decisions have given uh, liberty for some people to share the things they were thinking all along, but had learned not to share publicly. Uh, and for other people who perhaps um, are very swayed by bipartisanship, by whatever their party is saying at that time, have, have also joined that bandwagon. So these are not things that he invented that came from nowhere. They're impulses that have been around for a long time and are really coming coming to view. There seems to be no longer an ethical pretext to well. some folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I just want to say something about essentially all walls, all racism is really based on fear. You know, if you think about it, if, if we didn't fear one another or fear someone's going to break into our house or something, we wouldn't have walls, we wouldn't have fences, we wouldn't have borders. If, you know, but it's this fear mongering that it acts like, again, that uh, masonry, that wall that's being held together. The fear is what holds different groups together. Having an enemy <coughs> holds people together. And that's why you know, there are political groups that love divisiveness because it bonds them as a solid group against the other. I mean, all wars is turning, you know, this guy's the enemy, this is our, our ally. It's all based on fear, and also it's an excuse to basically bond people stronger together so they can be manipulated to fight the other. Absolutely. Maybe we should speculate a little bit about what um, Trump's fear is. Everything. That's <laughs> easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, is, this is something ironic. I mean, I write books about being behavior and stuff, and uh, this new book I'm working on, I realized that uh, you'll find that most people that are driven to rise to positions of power are people that felt powerless as children or they were bullied. And they're going to be the ones that are obsessing to make the money to be, you know, the, you know. So it's ironic that the, that our leaders tend to be the most neurotic and the most <laughs> insecure because they are the most obsessed and driven to get there. There are exceptions, but you know, there are some altruistic people who really do care, right? Because they care for other people. But the majority of people that are ruling our, our lives are nuts. <laughs> Right, so then let's talk a little bit about uh, maybe the uh, potential of where to overcome uh, the fear and heal some of these uh, nutty uh, uh, situations. Um, and I want to come back to something you said about your work, that uh, everyone can subjectively interpret it. If that is the case, why would not, why would not everyone bring his or her own projection and not learn anything? 
Um, well, uh, it could just reinforce their own attitudes. But one thing you can't deny in my work that it's made out of paper, and paper is fragile. And so um, you can't get out of uh, saying that these walls are not fragile, and that uh, we have the power as human beings to destroy walls true. very easily. Uh, we talked about mortar and brick and hedges, but what about barbed wire? Barbed wire. I mean, we know from Europe, we know from where I was born, behind barbed wire. So we, we, it's more than just brick and mortar. And I think you're absolutely right, it's all fear. Well, and, and the mention of barbed wire, I think, evokes one of the, the biggest areas where we're creating walls in our society in terms of our over-incarceration um, of vast portions of the, the population, especially within the, the private prison uh, complex. And the, the lack of understanding by many of us who don't have friends or family members in prison of what that means to a family and what that does to an individual uh, to be incarcerated for the amounts of time and in the conditions that you're incarcerating folks. Yeah. Maybe one last comment, or yeah. So, um, back to the app. When I first came to uh, inside the space, I put a call about uh, looking at the different walls and looking at the uh, you know, negative walls. Because <coughs> in, the, in Europe, when you look at the wall, it has a story, it has layers. Usually, you take a nice picture of it. You uh, enjoy looking at the wall. <coughs> and uh, sorry, I don't know, but when uh, I hear it, it's all about negative, negative. It's part of history, building up things, and usually they didn't last, as you say, in Paris, but they were a fortification, kind of like over the walls. So I feel more like in an optimistic view than a, this uh, fear, this uh, kind of uh, anguish towards the world. And also I'll say that the walls in the States are mostly ugly, so they have no walls, no windows. The way, like uh, the last uh, ship, black ship of construction. And even when you walk by a uh, LACMA, you have these blind walls, and it should be a celebration of architecture, mm -hmm. a nice wall. So the wall here has very different meaning than in Europe. And also uh, in Europe, you don't have any walls between borders. Mm -hmm. So it has a very different feeling, the feeling of you, uh, take, you come and you land, in the country, you cross, and it's, uh, you feel like you're welcome, and it's very difficult. So I hope this feeling will be the <coughs> here, you know, instead of feeling the less, because it's all about, we don't want this, we don't want that, you kind of have a different spectrum of it. So I was wondering if your work was mostly about an obstacle, war as an obstacle, or war as sometimes something that you appreciate as part of a history, because they all kind of look like an ancient walls. To me, mm -hmm. they don't look like brand new walls. And the world of Mexico is a brand new world. It's not an ancient world. So it's very different. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Because uh, I am attracted to old and worn walls, um, not new walls, because they have suffered and they've endured. And I think they're metaphors for the human condition. And uh, so uh, I have an appreciation for the surfaces. And what I aim for in manipulating paper is to create that um, distressed and aged quality, because I think it, it does speak to um, the power of, of history and, and human survival. Uh, and they bear the marks of, of the passage of time and weather. 
and the aging, which uh, are constant themes no matter what my subject matter is. It's the human figure. I treat the human figure in the same way as I treat these walls. Well, that would be the perfect thing to end on, but I, I was going to make one little taste for nice LA walls. <laughs> if you come up to the Yeti, I don't know if everyone knows this, but you know the travertine stone, which is sort of already aged stone, so maybe it, it's what it But it's not structural, so there's a little space between it and the wall. So they're actually musical. You can play music on the walls of the Yeti, so that's, that's a pretty nice one. That's a reference to the too. Yes, but it's a reference to yeah, yeah, so it's all. Europe has, has it better in many ways, including walls. And, and uh, if I may, I have a, a message also that has to do with what we've been talking in here. Um, we just invited an artist from Tijuana that has wrote, uh, he's written a, a book that we're going to present at the uh, Pasadena Library on the 24th. And the book is about the 30 years of art in Baja California. And, and we're going to have a panel discussion about what has been happening in this uh, 15, 20 years that we've been doing exchanges uh, with artists. And we have personalities that are going to have a discussion about what's happening in the border between artists. So everybody's invited the 24th of this uh, month. Where can we find more information about it? Stop right here. OK, perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, as much as I'd like to, to end on a positive note about walls, um, I, something has occurred to me that I, I feel like it would be remiss if we didn't include this in the conversation given our uh, American history, is just, you know, Wall Street. <laughs> the, the, the presence of that concept in, in our culture, in our society, uh, in our economy, but also, I don't know if everyone knows, some of you I'm sure do, um, what, why it is called Wall Street. That was the wall upon which slaves were stood um, when they were auctioned off. And so the very foundations of our economy come from a wall that has such deep uh, roots within the, the slave economy of this country as well. Now somebody say something positive about that. <laughs> Well, I think we covered the whole range from positive <laughs> to negative walls and also all kinds of sizes from border walls to jails to hedges. <laughs> Wasn't there a movie, Wally? Yeah. Wally, yeah. 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 And, oh. and thanking the walls of this gallery to hold on the walls of America. <laughs> yeah. Right. We also realized, I think, that uh, the discussion about walls can cover really everything yes. is possible. I thank you very much uh, for attending this uh, panel discussion and hope it was inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.